What do you see? Uh, maybe you have gone by somebody like this in the past. Maybe you've met somebody like this. Maybe uh, you've even been someone like this. And as you look at that picture, what needs does this person have? Well, he actually has one that he's spelled out for you right there on his sign. Food. Maybe you think shelter. Some warm clothes, especially in this last week, some, some protection against the bitter cold that we experienced a home, a, a job? What does he need? Or maybe take a look at this picture. What does he need? Support? Care? Love? Maybe intense physical therapy? Maybe prosthetics? Those needs are obvious. You can see them. But what do you need? If I were to ask you that question and say, when you look at your life, what jumps out to you? What is obvious to you? What do you need? Real rest? Financial stabilization? A career win, a, a win at your job so that you can feel proud and successful, so it'll re-energize you to keep moving forward. Maybe you need that, that spark to be reignited in your marriage, to rejuvenate it, or, or to restore what feels like it has become broken. What do you need? And what if you met someone who had the power and the ability to meet your needs, whatever they were, to meet them, to fix them, to solve them. What if you met someone like that? What would you ask that person for? As we continue our walk through this fast-paced, moving account that Mark gives us of Jesus of Nazareth, as we continue in this worship series talking about this race to the cross that Mark is giving us as he tells the story of Jesus, today Jesus' activity is going to highlight for us a need. A need that you and I have. Our ultimate need. Need A need the magnitude of which is so great that you cannot afford to miss it. And so we're going to dive in, Mark chapter 2. Mark tells us that Jesus had returned to his home base of operations, uh, this town of Capernaum. Last week, Pastor Dan told us that there was kind of a crossroads of activity that took place in Capernaum. So it made it a great place uh, to get to know people, to connect to others. And people found out. They found out that Jesus was back. And so there were crowds of people that flocked to this home where Jesus was. So many people, the crowd accumulated so much that they filled the house, standing room only, spilling out into the courtyard, spilling out into the streets. And they came because they wanted to listen. They wanted to listen to this teacher who spoke with authority. He preached a message that was, that was different, and it was good, and it was about God's love and compassion, and they wanted to hear it, and so they, they pressed up against one another. Body to body, shoulder to shoulder. They were willing to rub shoulders. They were willing to exchange sweat with the people around them. They didn't care. They were going to jostle and they were going to push and they were going to shove to get closer and closer to this teacher until there was no room left. And because this teacher taught with such authority, there were people who also came for more. These friends brought their friend to Jesus. And their friend had a need. A serious need. A need 
that needed to be addressed. And the only person that they knew of who could address this need, who could solve it, who could do something about what had occurred in this man's life was Jesus because this man was paralyzed. We don't know how, when, why, where. All we know is that he did not have the use of his legs. And in the first century, that was horrific. Because that meant that this man, he was completely dependent on everyone else. And this man, because he was completely dependent on any, everyone else, he couldn't support a family, he couldn't work a job. He was seen as a burden on society. He needed to depend on people like his friends who loved and, and com- had compassion on him enough that they wanted to bring him to Jesus so that then he could depend on Jesus. But the crowd was impermeable. There was no way to get to Jesus. So they got creative. They carried him up to the roof of that house. The roof was probably a, a flat roof. Uh, timbers or, or tree trunks placed over the top of the house and then covered over with leaves and branches. And then that would have been covered over with mud and clay. And so can you imagine the work that it took for these friends to dig, literally dig through the roof of this house to make an opening, tearing away at those branches, tearing away at the mud, the dust and debris falling down into the crowd below, falling onto Jesus' shoulders. They interrupted the message, disrupted Jesus' teaching. In the eyes of the crowd, they looked up above to see the destruction of property that's taking place up above them. And then these friends... They lower this man down on his mat. They put him right in front of Jesus. Bare, exposed, completely dependent on Jesus. And as the crowd sat breathlessly awaiting what Jesus would do next, instead, they heard what Jesus said. Because when Jesus saw their faith, the the trust that these people had, that when Jesus saw their friend, that he would do what was right for him, he would do what was needed, this breathless, anticipating crowd, they heard these words, Son, your sins are forgiven. Do you think that man was disappointed? You think his, his friends were disappointed? What, what about that crowd who had heard about the miracles that Jesus had done? Were they disappointed? You see, Jesus perceives beyond the obvious. If you're taking notes today, this is the first thing you can write down. Jesus perceives beyond the obvious to the ultimate need. But when Jesus said this, when he perceived that ultimate need and he said, your sins are forgiven, do you think that people were disappointed? This man, he had an ailment that Jesus could have fixed. The friends, that's why they brought him, the crowd, expecting to see an amazing miracle. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Were they disappointed when they heard those words? But more importantly, are you? Are you disappointed? We hear Jesus say, your sins are forgiven. And what are you here for today? What is religion for? Why do you come to church? Why do you want to listen to Jesus? And if all that Jesus is going to say to you is your sins are forgiven, will that be enough? 
for you. As Jesus perceives beyond the obvious to the ultimate, will you be able to have that same kind of perception? Because I know you have needs. There are needs that press hard against your heart. I had a whole list of them prepared that I, that I could share with you examples of the needs that we feel in our life, but I don't need to tell you what your needs are. You know the pain and the struggles that you go through in your life. You know the challenges. You know the places where you feel like you don't know how to take the next step forward. You don't know if you can take that next step. The places where you feel crippled by fear. You know those needs that press against your heart and yes they press against our hearts you know the pain that you felt you know the frustrations that you have but let me ask you something do you think that this man felt pain do you think that this man had frustrations in his life Imagine how frustrated he had been. And yet Jesus perceived beyond the obvious and he saw the ultimate need that this man had. Because Jesus knows that there are some needs that they will affect this life, but there are other needs that affect eternity. And so when this man was lowered in front of Jesus, when he was completely dependent on Jesus, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And dear friends, we are completely dependent on Jesus as well. When Jesus saw that this man had a serious need, yes, there was a very serious need that he had, a serious need that you and I have also. And without that need addressed, we are cut off from the God of all goodness. Without that need addressed, there is an impermeable barrier between us and our God. And we can't get there, not on our own. And that need is sin. It's a disobedience that we've had in our lives against God's commands, the ways that we haven't lived up to his almighty, holy, righteous expectations. And the guilt that comes from that sin, that guilt, it debilitates us. That guilt causes paralysis to set in in our hearts. It affects us with death itself, not just physical death, but spiritual and eternal death. And so our ultimate need is the forgiveness of sins. And so Jesus says these words to you. Jesus says to you, your sins are forgiven. Is it enough? Will you be disappointed in that? And I want you to really pay attention to how Jesus said those words to this man, how he says them to you. Because this is such amazing news, and it's amazing news that comes from an amazing Savior. Jesus said, Son, my son. This was a grown man to whom Jesus had no familial relationship. He didn't know this guy. They weren't tied together by blood. There was no relationship there except for the relationship that Jesus chose to have with this man. And when Jesus chose that relationship, he said, my son. Jesus wanted to emphasize to this man the deep compassion that he had. He said to him, I care for you as much as a father cares for their son. I love you as much as a parent loves their child. My son, your sins are forgiven. 
And Jesus wants you to know that too. Jesus wants you to know his deep compassion for you. And so when Jesus turns to you, he says, My dear child, my daughter, my son, your sins are forgiven. But we might have to wrestle with that. Can that possibly be true for me? Can I actually believe those words from Jesus? And the audience on that day, when Jesus said those words to that paralyzed man, that audience was more than an audience of one. Jesus had a captive audience, a massive group of people in this moment, and he knew it. And opinions formed quickly. We hear this from Mark chapter 2, verse 6. It says, Some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. A very strong accusation. Trying to call himself God. Who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, the words that Jesus spoke, they were not lost on those teachers of the law. They knew exactly what sin meant. They knew exactly what it took to forgive sins. You see, I can forgive your sins if you've done something wrong to hurt me. But I myself, on my own authority, I cannot give this blanket statement that forgives all of your sins that you have ever done. I don't have that kind of power. I don't have that kind of authority. But that's exactly what Jesus did. Your sins are forgiven, all of them. He meant all those sins, whether they were personal or public, whether they were active or passive, whether they were hurtful to others or they were hidden, buried deep inside this man's heart, all your sins are forgiven. Which means that Jesus was saying that all your sins, they strike against me. And the only person who can say that is God. These sins were ones that only God could forgive. And Jesus, he knew that too. And so Jesus emphasized his divine power and authority. And he emphasized that divine power and authority as he asked his next question, which he says, which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? I'll pose a question to you. Which one's easier? They both take the power of God. They both require a miracle to happen. One is visible, the other is invisible. One affects this lifetime, one affects all eternity. Which one's easier? They both require God's power. They depend on divine power alone, and that's exactly why Jesus did what he did next, where he turned to this man and he said, I tell you, Get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man stood up and he walked out in full view of all of them. Not a magic trick, no deception. This was real. They witnessed that miraculous healing. But the miracle was not the point. The miracle was not the point, but it did point to that which was much bigger, Jesus' authority to forgive sins. And you need to know this. This is so important for you. You need to know that this isn't some pipe dream out there. This forgiveness isn't just something that's, that's maybe there. Maybe it could be yours. No, forgiveness. Forgiveness is real because it rests on Jesus' authority. Your sins are forgiven. Wiped away, clean. No longer there. There is no more guilt. There is no more burden on your heart. You have access to God 
You are loved by your God. Forgiveness is real because it rests on Jesus' authority. And forgiveness was Jesus' purpose. He broke through the roof of heaven and he came down to this earth. He broke all of those barriers that existed between you and God. He took them all away as he entered into this world and he came through all the dust and debris of human depravity. He took on our own weaknesses. And he was not carried by friends. No, he was dragged by enemies. He wasn't laid on a mat. He was pounded into a cross, hoisted up on a hill, but he was bare and exposed before God, his heavenly Father, completely dependent on God, his Father. And though his Father looked on him with the utmost of compassion, the deepest of love, Jesus found no mercy. Because he was there with your sins and mine. He was there with your guilt and mine, and he took it upon himself so that it could be forgiven. And so when Jesus turns to you, when he says, dear daughter, my son, your sins are forgiven, that rests on his authority. Jesus can say that to you because he can say, I know Because it was my blood that was spilled for them. I know because it was my life that was given for them. Forgiveness is real and it rests on Jesus' authority. And so when a pastor gets in front of an assembled group of people after they have confessed their ultimate need and they have fallen before their God and he says, I forgive you all your sins, it's real. Because it rests on God's authority. And when young men and women come up here to this, this bowl, this font, as you witnessed this morning, when, when they come up here and water is splashed against their forehead and their hair gets wet, and the pastor adds the name of Jesus And says, you have newfound life, forgiveness and grace, clothed with the robes of Christ. It is real because it rests on Jesus' authority. And when your friend comes to you and and you're down and you're in despair and they say, hey, remember, your sins are forgiven. That is real because it rests on Jesus and his authority. And so, dear friends, let's, let's bring people to Jesus. Do you think that man was thankful for his friends? And all that they were willing to do for him? And if I were to ask you to, to make a list of the people who've brought you to Jesus, who would be on that list? Thank them. Thank them for what they've done for you. And if you think about the, the people in your life, the person who just, just keeps inviting and, and keeps encouraging and, and keeps pushing you to, to come around God's word and to hear what Jesus says to you, thank them. Parents, parents who brought your children to the waters of baptism today to hear the words of Jesus, to know that their sins are forgiven, thank you. Thank you for bringing your kids to Jesus. His authority and his power were connected here this morning. They're connected in the words that we speak. As we recognize that we are people with deep need. That we come before God in desperation and yet he gives us this incredible news. The best news ever. He says to us, your sins are forgiven. And so I'm going to put this picture up here one more time. I'm going to ask you what you see there. I'm going to ask you to to look around the room 
What do you see around this room? I'm going to ask you to think about looking in the mirror. And what do you see there? Dear friends, you have met someone like this. You have met someone like the paralyzed man that Jesus met. You've been someone like that. And so when we come before Jesus, let's not get distracted by all of our other needs that Jesus knows that we have and he cares with the deepest of compassion about them too. Let's not get distracted by those. Let's, let's perceive beyond the obvious and recognize our ultimate need and know that Jesus has met it. And listen well as Jesus says to us the best news ever. He says, your sins are forgiven. Amen? Amen. Amen.